Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about some basic principles, how the IR work, and eventually we're going to be focusing more on how to detect, uh, how to read a IR spectrum and how to use that to identify function groups. Just as in a small background on IR, the IR is going to have low energy, there are low energy radiations than your visible spectrum. So I can go and write down the IR is less energetic than the visible spectrum and uh, the energy of the IR is enough to kind of vibrate the bonds and also the bend the bonds so you can see those stretches in the bond uh, that can be observed in the IR region now we can take a bond as in a spring so when we take this bond as a spring we know the spring can stretch and compress and uh, when the spring or uh, stretching they're going to be absorbing some sort of ir radiation so if i take an example of maybe co2 and i know the carbon dioxide is a linear molecule where we have carbon double bonded with the oxygen and if i take this right there as my just in a demo for the molecule of co2 i can see two things happening there i can have a a stretch of the bond and in terms of stretching the bond or compressing the bond we can have something called an asymmetric stretch and in case of symmetric stretch we will have either both of those bonds being shorter or longer the same way so uh, I can call about this bond one and two they are both have the same length and they are longer but they are both the same length and I can talk about this bond one and two they are shorter now but they are compressed to this the same extent now that's your symmetric stretch on the other hand you can also have an asymmetric stretch where you would have one bond to be longer than the other one so I clearly see here the bond one here compared to the bond 2 is actually longer and then your bond 2 is shorter so that's going to be your asymmetric stretch so you will see two types of stretches and those two types of stretches will give you different signals in the IR spectrum and we'll talk about those uh, when we get in function groups like amine and amide in addition to that you can also see the bending so when we talk about bendings we are more or less talking about the change in the bond angles and uh, the bendings are something that uh, appears in the fingerprint region and we're not going to be focusing too much about them this video is going to be more focused on uh, the stretches and where those stretches can appear for a particular function group. Now let's talk about how you really read and how you really measure uh, the frequency in the IR spectrum. So the wave number or also called the spatial frequency is not going to be the same frequency that you would talk about which is measured in Hertz. It's the spatial frequency that's measured in centimeters inverse. It talks about the number of cycles you can have per unit of distance and this particular wave number or the spatial frequency has a symbol of mu and a bar on the top and it's actually going to be reciprocal of the wavelength so 1 over the lambda and uh, we can also talk about it's going to be actually equal to the uh, the frequency just the sim uh, simple frequency divided by the speed of light so both of those equations can be used to figure out the wave number but obviously we're not going to be doing any math in there but we're just going to be focusing on how we're going to be reading these wave numbers or spatial frequency now the range for this wave number goes anywhere between zero so I have this graph made here so it starts from zero and on to the right onto the left side it goes all the way up to the 4000 so we're going to be measuring the wave numbers or the spatial frequency there the spatial frequency and the wave number or the wave number is actually dependent on two things it's going to be directly proportional to the square root of bond strength and it's inversely related to the reduced mass 
So how does the bond strength is going to affect where the signal going to appear? It has a direct relation. So if I talk about maybe a, a carbon nitrogen bond and a carbon double bond nitrogen and a carbon triple bonded nitrogen, then I know the bond strength increases as the number of bond increases. So your C triple bond N is going to be more is going to be a stronger than a carbon double bond nitrogen and which is going to be more stronger than a carbon uh, single bond nitrogen. So when we look at where these particular stretches going to show up in an IR spectrum, your wave number or the fr spatial frequency for this particular c uh, carbon bonded nitrogen is going to be around approximately 1100 centimeters inverse uh, carbon double bond and nitrogen is going to show up somewhere around 1600 and carbon triple bond nitrogen is going to show up somewhere around 2250 so as you can see the bond strength increases your energy is also going to increase and as a result the wave number or the spatial frequency is also going to increase in that particular case so that's one factor that really determines where the signals or uh, of these particular function group will show up the second factor is a reduced mass if i want to figure out the reduced mass so i'll just write down m r e d the formula for that is going to be the the mass of atom 1 times the mass of atom 2 divided by the mass of atom 1 plus the mass of atom 2. Not likely you're going to be any calculating it, but just to, uh, be able to recognize how the mass is changing when you're comparing different bonds. So suppose I got a carbon-hydrogen bond versus a carbon-deuterium bond, and then I can talk about a carbon-oxygen bond, and then I can talk about and a carbon chlorine bond. So as you can see going from left to right the only thing that's changing is the second element we have hydrogen in the first case and then we got deuterium we got an oxygen and we got a chlorine so you can clearly see your mass is going to be going up as you move to the right because you know deuterium is heavier than the hydrogen and your oxygen is heavier than the deuterium and obviously your chlorine is heavier than the oxygen so your reduced mass is going up so if your reduced mass is going up, what's going to happen to the wave number there? Well, they are inversely related, so your wave number must be going down. So your CH bond shows up around 3,000, 3,000 to, let's say, 3,300. And then the carbon deuterium bond shows up around 2,200. And then carbon oxygen bond, carbon oxygen single bond is going to show up around 1,200. 11 to 1200 and then your carbon chlorine bond is going to show up around 700 so you can clearly see as your mass reduced mass goes up your wave number goes down so those are the two main factor that really determines where a particular bond is going to show up in the IR spectrum so first is how strong the bond is the second is the reduced mass now let's look at where like as an overall where they're going to show up. Now we just talked about uh, the carbon hydrogen bonds and a, car, and a single bond within the hydrogen. All the atoms, or I can talk about X as in a generic, I'm going to just write down X, H, and that X is literally going to be, could be an oxygen, could be in a nitrogen, could be in a carbon. So that's where that particular uh, atom hydrogen bond is going to show up. It's going to show up over 2700 all the way to the 4000. You have the other important region here is going to be between 2100 to 2300 and that's where your triple bond show up. So most likely we're going to have a carbon carbon triple bond or a carbon nitrogen triple bond showing up there. And then between 1500 to 1900 you're going to have a carbon oxygen double bond or a carbon nitrogen double bond or even a carbon carbon double bond being shown up there and then the rest of these bonds uh, the other stuff like carbon chlorine carbon oxygen carbon nitrogen is going to be showing up below 1500 now if you have if you look at the IR spectrum that's below 1500 it's kind of considered to be the fingerprint region and anything above is the diagnostic region
um, more information you actually get from the diagnostic region the fingerprint region is hard to read because you're gonna have so many peaks in there that doesn't necessarily mean you don't get any information on the fingerprint region you could still get inf a good information about a carbon oxygen carbon nitrogen bond because this shows up around 1100 1200 but it's still going to be very hard because there is just so many peaks below 1500 and uh, for the most part you focus on anything that's going to be over 1500 because you can get information about the functional groups over 1500 and that's what the IR is all about. In this lecture we're going to be focusing more on the diagnostic region and I'll have a separate video where we talk about the fingerprint region and how to analyze that. Um, so let's look at a uh, couple of NMR, uh, IRs there. So why do I say that fingerprint region is going to be hard to recognize and uh, the diagnostic region for a particular functional group is going to be the same regardless how big or the small molecule it's going to be? Let's take an example and let's look at a typical IR spectrum. I have two spectrums here right next to one another and the first one is in a secondary alcohol and then we got a tertiary alcohol there. Obviously the functional group is the same but they, all, they do have a different uh, skeleton structure there and uh, like I said your IR is going to be more or less focused on the be able to identify some of the unique stretches and including the functional groups so the functional group in both of these cases is actually going to be the OH and as a result the OH is going to be same in both of those cases the signal for the OH is going to be around 3300 it's a very broad stretch and a strong um, peak that you would see here and in both of those cases it's literally the same and then the next uh, signal you see here is going to be around right below 3000 and you have a signal right below 3000 in the second one as well so there's really not a much of a difference between those two when we're looking at the diagnostic region but when we go down below 1500 the below 1500 is going to be significantly different between one another and the reason why because the skeleton structure between those two is different uh, and uh, sometimes you can get an information about the skeleton structure using the fingerprint region but it's really hard to read uh, because you could have a carbon-carbon single bond stretching in a fingerprint region but then that particular stretch could be anything else as well it uh, could be other stretching as well because just there are so many single bond stretchings in there so like I said we're going to be focusing on anything that's going to be over 1500 as far as uh, being able to identify the functional group and some of the important peaks in there okay so the bottom line the take-home message right now is going to be the main task of the IR is going to be to identify the function groups and uh, some other important bonds like carbon hydrogen bonds in there the bond stretchings that you're going to be seeing I have a table here and obviously you guys can look up this table in your books as well and um, I would focus on uh, some of these so for example the alcohols where you're going to have the OH stretch. The OH stretch is going to be a broad stretch where it shows up between 3200 to 6, uh, 3600. So we actually just saw an OH stretch. If I go back here, this particular stretch was the OH stretch. So you can clearly see how it's right around 3300, but it kind of starts from you know a little bit lower than 3300 and goes all the way to like 3500. So it's going to be a broad and it's going to be a strong peak. The only time it's not going to be broader, it's going to be like a sharp peak if it's not able to make uh, intramolecular hydrogen bonds. Most of the alcohols will be able to make an uh, intramolecular hydrogen bonds with other molecules, but if it's not able to make intramolecular hydrogen bonds, then it will not be a strong, it will not be a broad peak in that particular case. Um, the second functional group I have here is the amine. So whether you have an amine or even the amide, you're going to have the NH stretches in there. So in this particular case, we're looking at these NH stretches here. 
and uh, it shows up it's gonna it's gonna be between 3300 to 3500 and they're not that strong and they are weak uh, they, they could be weak and strong but they're not really broad so we'll look at these examples one by one and I do want to mention one more thing if you have a if you have an amid as well, the amid NH will also show up at that particular place. So just because you're seeing the peak there, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be an amine. It could be an amid as well, but you will be able to identify by looking at the other peaks if it's indeed an amid or something else. Well, moving along, we got this carboxylic acid. The carboxylic acid is probably going to be the one compound that's most easiest to recognize because the OH stretch in the carboxylic acid is going to be a broad stretch that stretch around 2400 and goes all the way around to 3500. So you're going to have a very broad stretch there. And in addition to that, you will have a carbonyl peak as well. And we'll talk about the carbonyl peak in, in a minute. So if you have to confirm if that particular OH stretch is indeed coming from the carboxylic acid, then you can always look at the carbonyl peak around 1600. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, now you can have a carbon hydrogen stretch and that particular carbon in this particular case is going to be an SP carbon. That one shows up around 3300 to 3350 so that's uh, going to be a strong peak it's a sharp peak and then a carbon hydrogen stretch where the carbon is going to be an sp2 is going to be about 3000 it's going to be a little bit over 3000 so 3000 to 3100 so it's very important to be able to identify these peaks actually especially the sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch and an sp3 carbon hydrogen stretch so the difference between the sp2 and the sp3 is going to be the sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch shows up just above 3000 and your sp3 carbon hydrogen stretch shows up just below 3000 so it's going to be from 2850 to 3000 so it's very important to be able to identify these peaks right there and then in addition to that, if you have an aldehyde, the carbon hydrogen stretch of an aldehyde is also going to show up for somewhere around 2750 to 2900. And sometimes it does overlap with these SP3 carbon hydrogen stretches, so you have to kind of keep an eye on it. And then like I said, the triple bonded, uh, the carbon-carbon triple bond and carbon-nitrogen triple bonds, they're going to show up around 21 to 2300, so have these ranges in your mind. Um, Carbonyls are going to be your important ones to look for. The carbonyl is going to have a very strong peak, and you know carbonyls are actually present in multiple types of functional groups. You can have an a ketone, an aldehyde, an ester, a carboxylic acid, and amides and whatnot. So they all going to show a strong peak around, let's say, between 1600 to 1800 and um, they will have small differences when in in the presence of the peak when we go from one function group to another function group so for example this uh, acid chloride carbonyl shows up around 1750 to 1850 this ester shows up between 1720 to 1750 so it's a good idea to kind of have the ranges of those uh, in your mind, the carboxylic acid carbonyl peak is going to be showing up around 1700 to 1750. Now, to double check or to just kind of confirm if you indeed have the carboxylic acid, you kind of go back and look for the OH stretch that you just talked about for the carboxylic acid. Remember, your OH stretch is going to be between 2400 to 3500. And we'll have examples, and you will see what I was really talking about in that particular case. The ketone is going to show up around 1715 to 1745. Your aldehyde kind of overlaps with the ketone, shows up between 1720 to 1740. And then amides has a little bit broader range, goes anywhere between 1550 to 1700. And then your anhydrides. Anhydrides are actually the important ones. So you have two carbonyls actually there and it turns out you will see two peaks in there uh, 
you will have one peak around 1800 and one peak around 1750 and uh, one of them usually a little bit stronger peak than the other one you will see two um, peaks in there however and then if you have a carbon carbon double bond that's going to be between 1600 to 1680 that's usually weak and if you have an aromatic so in aromatic you do have a carbon carbon double bond so obviously you will see a peak around 1600 to 1680 but in addition to that you will also see another peak if there is an aromatic present around 14 between 1400 to 1550 and those peaks are also going to be weak so we'll talk about these as we move along uh, with the examples well let's look at uh, how you're going to be reading some of these graphs uh, before we jump into the examples so if I have if I look at this particular first one here um, I, you always want to start from the left side move to the right side of the graph and see what particular peaks you get now in this particular case on the first graph if I look at uh, the 3000 line there I can draw a line straight line there hopefully that's straight enough okay let me redraw that actually so it's right there so you can clearly see there is a peak that's going to be right over 3000 and obviously there are peaks that's going to be right below 3000 so what do these peaks belong to well if you go back to our list here remember I said you want to be very careful and be able to identify those sp2 carbon hydrogen stretches and your sp3 carbon hydrogen stretches so if you see anything over 3000 just above 3000 is going to be an sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch and anything below 3000 is going to be an sp3 carbon hydrogen stretch so in this particular case I know this particular one is going to be in a carbon hydrogen but then this particular carbon is going to be an sp2 or another way of saying there is going to be a double bond close by and then this particular this uh, peak right below 3000 is going to be in a carbon hydrogen stretch and that particular carbon is going to be an sp3 now let me ask you this question can you have a carbon carbon double bond and not have that particular peak we just talked about that's a little bit over 3000 well the answer is yes what if you have a tetra substituted alkene what if you have something like a carbon carbon double bond and then you got R groups or you know methyl groups or any alkyl groups around those carbons or another way of saying those double bonded carbons do not have any hydrogens on it so in that case you will not see a carbon a sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch because you really don't have one in there but you still have a carbon carbon double bond so just because you don't see that peak in there that does not necessarily mean you don't have a carbon carbon double bond okay what about this next graph here so in the next graph uh, next spectrum you we can clearly see there is an, a, a big peak down there and then we got some peaks down here as well so this peak which is going to be it's about 3300 a little bit over 3300 that's going to be a carbon hydrogen stretch but that drop carbon is going to be an sp carbon so if I go back to my table here so remember we have a carbon hydrogen stretch at about 3300 and that carbon is going to be an sp hybrid carbon and uh, my next question is going to be the same just like I asked earlier for the carbon carbon double bond can you have a carbon carbon triple bond and not have that particular peak at about 3300 the answer is yes what if you have an internal alkyne something like this if you have an internal alkyne you will not see that particular peak at 3300 because there is no hydrogen attached to the sp carbon but uh, to you know to confirm that you will have a peak around 2200 because remember this carbon carbon uh, carbon triple bonded carbon stress shows up around 2200 as well so you can always look at that particular peak just like we have right there so that one is going to be a carbon carbon stretch as well what other peak shows up around 2250 
Well, remember carbon triple bond and nitrogen or the nitrile groups also shows up in that particular region. So suppose if you don't have a peak at about 3300 and if you do see peak at about 2250, that means that could be either a carbon triple bond nitrogen or it could be an internal alkyne. In that case, you, it's going to be hard to tell the difference. If you see a peak around 3300, that that kind of gives it away that it's an in, uh, um, it's going to be an external, or it's going to be a terminal alkyne in that particular case. What about uh, this peak right below 3000? Well, that's going to be your carbon hydrogen stretch where that carbon is going to be an sp3, just like we had in the previous case. Okay. Well, as we move along here. Now, this next uh, spectrum I have here, or the part of that spectrum I got there, these two stretches, these two peaks that you see here, those are going to be your NH2 group. Now, you may wonder that you're seeing those two um, stretches there, or those two signals there, because you have two hydrogens. Um, well, technically, yes you have two nit two hydrogens there and that's the reason why you see those two peaks there however not for the right reason the reason why you see those two peaks in there is because you can have at a given time you can have so-called an asymmetric stretch so i can have suppose these nitrogens and hydrogen bonds to be the same so that would be your symmetric stretch or you can also have something called an asymmetric stretch where this nitrogen will have one hydrogen to be longer. One nitrogen hydrogen bond is longer, but the other nitrogen hydrogen bond is shorter. So in that particular case, that would be your asymmetric stretch. So just because you can have both a symmetric and asymmetric stretch, and you have an, like a, almost a 50-50 shot of getting both of those, and as a result, you see those two peaks in there. And turns out you will get only symmetric and asymmetric stretch if you indeed have two nitrogen hydrogen bonds there. If you have only one, then you're not going to have an uh, asymmetric and symmetric both together. You're just going to have one type of stretch in there. So that means if you have an, a secondary amine, so this next graph actually belongs to the secondary amine or secondary amide, you can say. If I have an R group here, another R group there, and there is only one hydrogen there, this particular nitrogen-hydrogen stretch is where is what we are seeing in this particular graph. And suppose if you have an tertiary amine, if you have an tertiary amine, you probably won't even you're not going to see anything in that particular region. So just because you have you don't have anything in that particular region around 3300 does not necessarily mean you do not have an amine function group in there. In addition to that, let's look at this next one here. So this next one, we actually seen it before. This one is going to be your alcohol stretch. So it's going to be an OH stress stretch coming from the alcohol function group. And then again, what type of uh, um, carbon hydrogen stretches we have? Well, these are below 3000. So it's going to be in a carbon hydrogen stretch where carbon is going to be an sp3 or you can also say saturated carbon hydrogen stretch so those are some of the main ones and uh, let's jump into the examples now so typically typical question for the ir involves uh, you are given a spectrum and you got to figure out what are the main peaks you have in there so starting from the left side and as i move along to the right side i do see a very broad stretch right there and uh, I can clearly see that this stretch is kind of starting right around 2300 and then kind of going all the way to like 3400. So remember what we said about if you have a very broad stretch that starts from 2300 and goes all the way to 3400. Well, if I go back to my table here, we, we have this stretch right there, the OH stretch of the carboxylic acid starting in that particular range. So that means this probably going to be a carboxylic acid all right so i can say this is going to be a um, some sort of carboxylic acid stretch this one right there and just to confirm we know we're going to be seeing a carbonyl peak around 1700 and we can go back and uh, uh, look along the line here and if you do see peak uh, 
a very strong peak at about uh, what's that going to be? That's sixteen hundred. That's seven, almost at seventeen hundred. So that's going to be your carbonyl peak. So that actually gives it away that it is indeed going to be in a carboxylic acid. So when I go back into my list of compounds that's given to you. Um, we can figure out which particular one has carboxylic acid. So we got a carboxylic acid on the first one. The second one, we don't have a carboxylic acid. It's in a ketone, so we can rule that one out. The third one is just going to be an alcohol, so we rule that one out as well. The fourth one is also in carboxylic acid, so that could be your compound as well. So between the first one and the fourth one, now we got to look for the difference. What's the difference? Uh, well, we can clearly see we got a, an aromatic there and we have just uh, saturated hydrocarbon. So another way of saying you have a carbon-carbon double bond there. And remember where the carbon-carbon double bond shows up? It's usually a mild peak that shows up uh, around 1600. And if you have an aromatic, you will have a peak between 1400 to 1500 as well. And we can clearly see that uh, these peaks right there, that's about uh, 1600. That's going to be a carbon carbon stretch there. And then you'll see another one down there, these two right there, those are going to be a uh, carbon carbon stretch. And uh, you would not see those peaks if you had just in a carbon carbon single bond. So as a result, uh, my compound must be the first one here, just because you have those aromatic stretches in that particular region. Okay, let's look at this next one, and it's probably going to be a good idea if you can pause the session and figure this out on your own. All right, so I assumed uh, you did pause the session and figured out the main stretches that you see in the spectrum. So let's just uh, move from left to right. We have this uh, long signal here that's around 3300. So what this shows up around 3300, and this particular type is actually going to be a carbon hydrogen where that carbon is going to be an SP now this may very well could be like an alcohol stretch if it's not making hydrogen bonds or it could very well be an amine stretch um, but remember your amine stretch are not that strong but you always want to have in the back of your mind that those stretches always also shows up in those particular regions so those could be this, this stretch could be coming from those function groups as well. And you can always double check if it's indeed in a carbon-carbon triple bonded, if it's indeed in an SP carbon hydrogen stretch by looking at a carbon triple bonded stretch. And a carbon triple bonded carbon stretch shows up around 2200. So this particular peak right there is going to be a carbon triple bond carbon peak. So if you didn't have that, suppose, if you didn't have this peak around 2200, that means this probably be coming from somewhere else. It could, in that case, very well be an alcohol that's not making hydrogen bonds, or it could be a, an amine peak just happens to be very strong in that particular case. Um, and then in addition to that, what else have we got? We got a peak right below 3000, so that's going to be your SB3 carbon hydrogen stretch. And uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, we got some regions below 1500, but just like I said, focus on the diagnostic part first and see if you can identify what functional groups you have. Okay, so we got in a nitrile there. Well, you know, you have a, in a carbon, you have a peak around 2200, which could very well be in a nitrile peak, but then you also have this peak around 3300 which tells you that it's going to be an SP carbon hydrogen stretch. So it's got to be in a terminal alkyne. So the only terminal alkyne you see here is going to be this one right there. Now, between this first and second one, let's call this first and this second one, what would be the difference in the IR spectrum of between one and two? Um, well, they're both going to have in a carbon, they're both going to have a peak around 2200, and that's going to be <coughs> either a carbon nitrogen triple bond or it's going to be a carbon carbon triple bond and that's pretty much it and other than that you can't really tell the difference uh, 
on the diagnostic region, you may have a big difference in the fingerprint region, but the diagnostic region may not be able to tell the difference between one and two. So in those cases, you got to look for the NMR and some other stuff. Let's look at this next one here. So I urge you guys to pause the session and figure out what's going on here. So I got a signal around uh, right below 3000. So that's going to be your SP3 carbon hydrogen stretch. And uh, we have a signal. Well, this is in a unique signal right there that have, we haven't really seen that's looking at to be about 2750 right there and uh, what shows up around 2750 so if I go back to my graph here and uh, we can clearly see that 2750 to 2900 we could have a carbon hydrogen peak and that carbon is going to be coming from an aldehyde functional group So this could be an uh, aldehyde actually and we can obviously confirm that by looking at the carbonyl so let's uh, before we actually can say that it is indeed in carbonyl it is indeed an aldehyde let's look at the carbonyl there the carbonyl peak is at about that's 1600 1700 and that's going to be 1750 so that's about 1725 and if I go back and look for the range of our carbonyls for the aldehyde it is about uh, 1740 to 1720, so it is indeed going to be an aldehyde. Now, how would you know if this was not an aldehyde but a ketone? Because the carbonyls for the aldehydes and the ketones kind of overlap um, in terms of the positions. Well, if this wasn't a ketone, then you would not have this carbon hydrogen stretch at about 2750 because ketones don't really have a hydrogen onto the carbonyl carbon. So let's see what we got here. We got a aldehyde here, so that one is an aldehyde. The second one is a ketone, so you can't have a ketone. The third one is an ester, and the fourth one is an acid. So it's got to be the first compound in that particular case. Okay, what about this next one here? So it seems like we got two signals there. Do they look familiar? Well, yes, they do look familiar. So remember, those two signals could be your NH2 groups. Now, whether they are the amines or the amides, that's a different story, but they very well could be the NH2 uh, signals. And obviously, you want to look at other signals as well to confirm that it's indeed an NH2 signal or something else. Uh, but uh, for the most part, that's where the NH2 shows up. In addition to that, you have signal right below 3000. That's going to be a carbon hydrogen stretch where carbon is going to be sp3. And then as you're moving along, how would you know if this is going to be an amine or an amide? Well, I do see a strong stretch around 1650. Now remember, for the amides, carbonyl shows up anywhere between 1550 to 1700, so this is indeed in the range, so that's got to be a carbonyl. So if you have a carbonyl there, and if you have an amine there, if you have an NH2 there, it's a very good chance that you have an amide, alright, so that could be very well be an amide there, so I'm not going to have an amine for sure. We could have an amide, so that's a possibility there. The second, the third one is also an amide, but what's the difference? There is a sp2 carbon hydrogen in this third example there, but we don't really have any peak over 3000 there. So since you don't have any peak over 3000, that means there should not be any carbon, any sp2 carbon hydrogen stretches, so you cannot have this particular one. What if, what if you can have an, a carbonyl and an amine, like in this fourth example there? Uh, well, it's a possibility, but uh, let's look at the ranges. Yes, the NH2 here and the NH2 here, uh, you may not be able to tell the difference uh, based on the IR. However, you can tell the difference between your carbonyls. So the carbonyls of your ketones and your carbonyls of your 
um, amides, they may not show up at the same place. Uh, the ketones are kind of restricted to 17, 15 to 17, 45. And if you do see the carbonyls at, in that particular range, that means it, it's then it, in that case, it's got to be the ketone and the amine functional group. But what we really have here, this particular functional group or this particular carbonyl here is actually at 1650. So it's not really in the ketone range. So that's why it's got to be this second one right here. What about this next one? Uh, seems going from the left seems simple so far. We got a sp3 carbon hydrogen stretch moving along. There's nothing else until we get down to around uh, let's say that's 1800, and then we got something at about 1700 or 1750. Well, remember what we said when you can have two peaks. If you have two peaks in the carbonyl regions then it's got to be a anhydride so do we have anhydride there well that's an key that's an aldehyde you can an aldehyde and in the aldehyde you would see that stretch uh, the carbon hydrogen stretch and you don't really have that there and no ester no amide and then uh, uh, because the the ranges for these amides carbonyls and these ester carbonyls are not uh, really going to match with what we have here and then uh, obviously since we're seeing those two peaks in there it's got to be the anhydride so it's going to be oops, this one right there okay moving along what do we see here well, we clearly have a peak right above 3,000, so that's going to be your unsaturated carbon hydrogen stretch, or another way of saying it's going to be an sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch. You also have an sp3 carbon hydrogen stretch. Okay, moving along, you see a peak about, hmm, what's that region right there? It's going to be, that's between 1650 to 1700, so let's say about, uh, 1680 to 1690 that's where your peak is so let's see what we could possibly have there um, we have an adult bonded carbon hydrogen stretches so we do have an adult bond in this first molecule right there and we do have a ketone here uh, so it's a possibility so you know that's one of them right there uh, the second one, we don't really have any unsaturated carbon hydrogen in the structure, so that means that cannot be the guy. On the third one, we have an adult bond. Okay, so we got an adult bond there, and we got a carbonyl, so that could be a possibility as well. And on the fourth one, what we got going on, we do have an adult bond on the fourth one, but there is no carbon. There's no sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch or hydrogen bond there because uh, those double bonded carbons in this particular case they are tetra substituted. Another way of saying there's no hydrogen to them, so that means this cannot be your compound either because you don't really have any carbon hydrogen. So you got to look for all the possibilities. Now between the first and the third one, how do you really know which one is going to be your compound? Well, it turns out they are both uh, ketones. And uh, there is going to be a difference between the first one and third one. The first one is not conjugated. The second one is an uh, alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And uh, what happens when your double bonds are conjugated? Well, in the first case, I know ketones usually shows up around the 1750 to 1745. And if the ketone is in, indeed conjugated with the double bond close by, which it's not in the first structure, but it, it is in the third structure, then the stretch of that carbonyl is going to be less than what would you expect. So it usually shows up around 1715, but since it's going to be making a, con it's going to be conjugated with that double bond, it's going to be actually anywhere between 1650 to 1700.
and that's exactly what we're really seeing here. The peak, the cardinal peak is at about 1680, so that means this particular cardinal got to be conjugated with the double bond. So as a result, our final answer is going to be this guy right there, not the first one. If you had the carbonyl peak at about 1725, then it would have been your first answer, first option there. Okay, let's look at this next one here. Uh, clearly, we can see there is a sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch. We can also see there is a sp3 carbon hydrogen stretch. Um, as you move along, you do see all these peaks right there. They're just the overtones. Uh, the, mo the other important ones you see right there is going to be one about 1600 and one about 1500. Then uh, the one at 1600 is not that strong, so that means there might be a carbon carbon double bond. And the one at 1500, well, if you have another one close by, then must be an aromatic. All right, so, well, we do have aromatics in all of those compounds, but I want to make sure we have in the first one, if I look, I got an CH3 group there, so I do have a carbon hydrogen, and that carbon is going to be sp3 hybrid. And the second one, there is going to be no carbon hydrogen where carbon is sp3. And the same story with this third one, we don't really have an sp3 carbon hydrogen. So as a result, it's your answer option is going to be the first one because you do see the peaks of uh, carbon sp3 carbon hydrogen stretches in there okay what about this next one here we have a very similar scenario is the last one in the beginning we got an sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch and then we have an sp3 carbon hydrogen stretch and what else we got going on we have a uh, at a peak at about this position right there, a peak at about this position. But let's look at our answer options there. Uh, well, make sure you have both sp2 and sp3 carbon hydrogen stretches. And the only structure that actually has both of those turns out to be the first one. If I look at all of them, there is no carbon hydrogen stretch where carbon is sp3. There, in the third one, there is no sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch. And on the fourth one, again, there is no sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch. So sometimes you got to look at all of them and use the process of elimination to um, get the one that really matches with the spectrum. Okay, let's look at this last one here. So we got... Uh, um, we don't really have anything until we get to this 3000, right below 3000. So that means we got a saturated carbon hydrogen stretch or sp3. And then along with that, as we move along, there is a signal at about 20 to 50. So that's got to be either a carbon carbon triple bond or a carbon nitrogen triple bond. So just keep both of those in mind for right now. And then what else we got? We have a another peak right around 16. Well, it's actually around around 17. It's a little bit over 1700. So I would say maybe 1705 um, because it's right above 1700. And uh, what else we got? That's pretty much it. Let's see if we can figure out uh, if we can match uh, any of those peaks with the given structure there. We gotta have an, a car either a carbon carbon triple bond or a carbon nitrogen triple bond. I think I wrote down the nitrogen twice there. It's gonna be carbon carbon triple bond or a carbon nitrogen triple bond. And uh, we gotta have what else? A carbonyl peak. Well they all have a carbon carbon triple bond and they all have a carbonyls. But I don't really see any peak around at thirty three hundred. Or another way of saying there is no carbon hydrogen stretch where carbon is going to be sp so that means it cannot be a terminal alkyne it's got to be an internal alkyne so i cannot have this first one because the first one has an internal alkyne so it's going to be the second one or the third one 
But the difference between the second one and the third one is just the presence of this uh, double bond here. So this double bond should give you a sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch right above 3000. But we don't really see that. So there is no sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch. So since there is no sp2 carbon hydrogen stretch, your final molecule got to be the second structure in that particular case. All right, so this is how you're going to be reading different IR signals. Um, use the diagnostic region mainly to figure out what particular function groups you have and use the process of elimination to figure out to, um, to kind of narrow down to your particular molecule. If you have any questions, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.